Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a piece of work that I started last December when I was asked to uh, prepare a paper for the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Um, and I'll explain that since then I've set up a, an expert group um, and this morning um, I was corresponding with the uh, World Health Organization um, Global Governance uh, and Ethics Unit um, because the World Health Organization is currently looking at the governance of genome editing and they've acknowledged that there is a patent gap, that they haven't looked at patents um, in their studies, so they're encouraging my expert group, and if any of you'd like to participate, you'd be very welcome, to um, inform them about why patents are part of the governance system that the WHO needs to be looking at for genome editing. Um, so I started really from the, the position with my, with my study last year that while there have been intense debates underway about the scientific and ethical implications of genome editing, there's been insufficient attention uh, paid to the patenting issues of these new transformational uh, technologies. And uh, while acknowledging some of the excellent work that's, that's been done in this area um, on, on genome editing, um, the wider scientific community outside patent law experts really need to consider urgently the implications of, of patenting these inventions, of course, taking into account notions of order publica morality. Um, and also while genome editing has great potential in terms of its transformational role in healthcare and well-being in society, um, the granting of these patent rights, as you know, can have profound implications in terms of affordability and access, particularly for people living with chronic lifelong illnesses um, or prevent preventable inherited uh, medical conditions. Um, so what I'm trying to do is encourage the scientific community to consider carefully the impact of granting patents on genome technologies um, and the need to balance rewards for inventorship with the implications for affordability and access um, and human rights that this group, of course, are, are, are well familiar with. Um, so genome editing technologies, as I said, that it, there's great potential for research and for society at large. Um, it's a fast, efficient and precise, relatively inexpensive tool to modify the cells of any living organism. So this might be a genome editing technique for cells of the body of a living human being, and we call that somatic cell modification. So you could potentially cure patients of chronic lifelong illnesses through, through somatic genome editing. Um, there's also the, the issue that I'm really gonna focus on, uh, which is to do with the editing of human embryos. Um, in order to modify the germline identity of human beings. And you can probably see where I'm gonna go with this with the, the patenting of um, inventions relating to the germline identity of human beings, um, eradicating hereditable diseases in newborn babies and creating resistance to lifelong conditions. What I'm not gonna talk about, but in my wider group, which is advising the WHO, we're also looking at non-human uses of, of genome editing, such as new plant varieties, which are disease resistant or higher crop yield, um, and animal uses. The Nuffield Council on Bioethics is, look, is looking at this and is part of my expert group as well, um, about how genome editing can contribute positively to food security. So great potential. Um, uh, and let me now explain a little bit about what, CRISPR genome editing uh, entails. So there were earlier um, versions of, of genome editing through um, zinc finger talons um, and the talons uh, methods, which were quite complicated and unpredictable. Um, and one of the issues which I won't bother discussing in detail here is that even with CRISPR, there's a lot of concern about off-target events. So you edit, part of the genome and it has unexpected off-target effects which might only exhibit in six or seven generations time. Um, so those risks are, are, are less now with, with genome editing through CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and essentially what this is, is, is 
um, it's, it's, to, to give CRISPR its full name, it's Clustered Regulatory Interspace Short Palindromic Repeats. So it's repeating um, uh, sections in, in the DNA. And it, it, when uh, CRISPR is used in combination with Cas9, which is an associated protein, which is given the number nine, um, this can then um, use CRISPR, which originally, or in its, in its natural state, um, CRISPR is an Im immunological defense system. So the way that CRISPR works in its natural state is that with, within a, a living organism, um, the CRISPR will remember um, a, a virus which has attacked uh, the living organism. And then the Cas9 will go in and relying on the CRISPR to identify what the, the virus which has been encountered before, the protein Cas9 will go in and attack and cut out the, this, this alien virus. So a simple analogy uh, would be with a word processor document um, whereby the author would search for, and that would be the CRISPR part, searching for the misspelt word, and then the Cas9 would go in and delete uh, the typographical error, and then could then um, knock in uh, the correct uh, the correct spelling. In my analogy, with a word processor, so it's it's a great technology. And if you read some of the leading scientists in, in this area, like Jennifer Dudna, they point out just how how simple it is for. Um, for scientists to use this technology. So it has great potential, um, but it also, of course, raises critical public policy issues um, that I think as, as patent lawyers we should be interested in. Um, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. So just to give you a little bit more background to the science, um, the human genome is contained in 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, in a sequence of cared, uh, paired chemical bases, which are held together in um, long molecules of DNA um, that are present in almost all cells of, of living organisms. Uh, and in my example, it's the human genome. Um, so the genome is a complete set of the genes um, with regions of the DNA molecules of varying length, um, and they're interspersed with non-coding regions that regulate when the genomes are expressed. So although two people uh, will have similar sets of genomes, even identical twins will not have exactly the same genome. Um, from time to time, inherited genomic variations will result in disease or confer on an individual a predisposition to a particular disease. And this usually comes uh, about due to small changes in the genome, uh, and those can be transmitted on to future generations. So these might be life-limiting conditions, such as muscular dystrophy or cystic fibrosis. Um, genetic conditions are also significant causes of infertility or pregnancy loss or neonatal death. Um, and Huntington's disease is, is a typical example um, of a single genome um, defect, which potentially could be corrected through uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so I'll explain a little bit more about how the technique works uh, in a minute. But before I do that, let me just explain um, who the leading inventors are in this field, because um, we'll be coming onto these people when we talk about uh, the patent uh, disputes which have arisen. So CRISPR, in combination with Cas9, first came to public attention in 2012 uh, with the publication of this seminal paper in Science by Jennifer Dudna at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and Emmanuel, Emmanuel uh, Charpatier, who at the time was based in Sweden, and is now director of the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. And in their science paper, together with their collaborators, they demonstrated that CRISPR-Cas9 can be used to cut and possibly 
which is important. They said it could possibly use to edit DNA in vitro. So they predicted that it could be used um, for uh, editing uh, human embryos in the way that I've just described. Um, so CRISPR-Cas9, it was adapted from this naturally occurring genome editing bacteria, which is part of the immune system. So the bacterial immune system captures snippets of DNA, as I explained with my word proce processing analogy. Um, it, it captures DNA from the invading virus, and it uses them to create DNA segments, which are known as these CRISPR arrays, which then can identify a virus in the future. Um, and if you were wondering, yes, there is a lot of research going on now about using CRISPR in the COVID-19 response. There's a lot of been work being done on um, using CRISPR um, to generate a T-cell response uh, in, in COVID patients. So to put it another way, in nature, when humans become infected from vi a virus, their immune system will use the CRISPR DNA to in and they then encode an RNA recognition sequence, um, which has been retained from the previous virus attack by the same bacterium. And that RNA sequence then produces um, a mechanism by which it, it matches with the previously known virus, virus and the Cas9 goes in and snips out um, the bacteria. So now let's start to come on to the patents. Um, this is from the, uh, the original patent, um, which was um, first disclosed uh, as an invention in the Science Journal. So this is a US uh, uh, patent document. So it was pre-AIA, so it was under the old um, interference proceedings rules. Um, and uh, I'll explain a bit more about the case in a minute, but the, the diagram which comes from the, the original patent document is quite illustrative. Um, so what we're seeing here is that with CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, what's happening in a laboratory is that the bioscientists are able to create a small piece of this RNA, uh, which is a short guide. So you can here you can say, see in the patent document, it refers to the CRISPR RNA, which is going in and it's guiding um, and creating a small, a small piece of the RNA which can then target a sequence of, of the DNA in the genome. And the RNA binds then to the, the Cas uh, so that the genome editing can take place. So as I've explained, this is potentially of you know, great significance in terms of medical research, because right now there's work being done on whether particularly single genome disorders like cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, Huntington disease, sickle cell anemia, they could effectively go in uh, by a scientist and, and cut out the uh, defective gene. So what we're seeing here, uh, as I've explained, is the CRISPR RNA, um, and we see a double strand target DNA, and the, uh, the CRISPR RNA pairs with the, another short RNA and then a trans-activating CRISPR RNA um, is activating an enzyme to, to a viral or to some other DNA sequence um, that's already been identified. And then the, um, the Cas9 is going in and is cutting out uh, the defective genome. And at that point, you, of course, you can then knock out completely the, um, the genome which is expressing for the disease in question, um, or you can even knock in um, a healthy genome. So you can knock out or knock in. So they call this uh, system by which the enzyme is cleaving and destroying and offending DNA. Okay, so that was kind of the sciencey bit um, behind this. Um, You'll have probably heard about most of what I've been talking about through um, the wide media attention that was given to the case of Lulu and Nana, the, the two baby girls, the twins that were born in China. Um, 
And this was in November 2018, when a Chinese researcher from the Southern University of uh, Science and Technology in Shenzhen, Dr. He uh, Jianqiu, revealed at the second international summit on sh human genome editing in, in Hong Kong, um, that he'd gone ahead despite like an, an unofficial moratorium amongst the bioscience community that they weren't going to mess around with this technology until it was deemed safe because of the off-target effects that I've already described. Um, but he went ahead and did this and implanted into a female embryo, um, two female embryos of these twins, um, an edited gene. And essentially what he did was that he disabled a genetic pathway for HIV. And he claimed to have disabled a gene which is called uh, CCR5, which encodes for a protein which usually allows um, HIV to enter the cells. Um, so this was the paper that he attempted to uh, publish. So it was submitted to a number of leading scientific journals for peer review. Um, and in an act of solidarity, the scientific community refused to um, peer review his paper. So it was leaked to the MIT Technology Review, um, but was never peer reviewed. So if you like, there's kind of a soft law by the scientific community that they were going to self-regulate this um, and not allow this research to be, to be published. This um, gene called CCR5 that he claimed to have um, knocked out and, and then sort of uh, edited um, actually is present in about six to eight percent of the global population. So, six to eight, two, to eight percent of the global population uh, are less likely than the rest of the, the world's population to contract HIV um, because of the uh, of the, the, the defect in, in the CCR5 gene. So he um, mirrored this in Lulu and Nana uh, in their embryos, and these two baby girls were subsequently born. Um, the objection of the scientific community, apart from the fact that there was a, a generally accepted de facto moratorium on this type of uh, clinical application, is that if the gene is disabled, um, the twin baby girls, um, with CCR5 disabled are now thought likely to be more, more um, receptive to other types of illness, such as the common flu virus um, or the effects of West Nile uh, virus. So um, this is an illustration, again, from uh, UC Berkeley of, of some of the studies that have been undertaken to show that actually the, the kind of the the results of this, this type of in vitro work um, can have profound implication, implications for the people who are born with the um, um, mutated genes. So that brings me again to the, the patent disputes. Um, we, we saw earlier the, the diagram, which was from the UC Berkeley patent. Um, I said that this was a, a pre-AIA patent. So now we see what happened when it went to interference proceedings and subsequently to the um, uh, federal uh, uh, circuit uh, courts of appeals. So Jennifer Doudna and her collaborators at UC Berkeley um, uh, were the named co-inventors in the uh, the 859 patent with a priority date of 25th of May 2012. That's when the Science Journal was published. Um, uh, there were then interference proceedings um, lodged by the Broad Institute. Now the Broad Institute is MIT and Harvard uh, and various others. So it's a, it's a research institute based um, on the East Coast. And the Broad Institute uh, claimed that the, um, uh, the foundational work that had been done on CRISPR technologies by UC Berkeley, um, that they claimed that, that what had been specified in, in the patent document, in, in, in the disclosure and the claims, um, referred to a very broad set of claims to all CRISPR-Cas9 systems in, in, a, in, in a eukaryotic um, state. Um, and it also, the claims were very broad in the fact that they were all directed to CRISPR systems in any environment. 
So at the USPTO, the Patent Trial and Appeals Board then um, found in favour of uh, the junior party broad and said that it was terminating interference proceedings by accepting the claims of broad um, pertaining to the use of the eukaryotic cells, um, which were sufficiently distinct because of the you know, specific language used in the claims from the broader language uh, used in the Berkeley claims to the use in any of the, any environments. So what we think is going to happen uh, when these claims are reassessed at the PTO is that um, there will be you know, specific um, boundaries on which, which um, elements are granted in the Berkeley um, patent uh, with restricted restrictions on the claims and which parts of the technology are specifically uh, allowed for broad. So there you can see that uh, how this was, this, the, um, the, the uh, Patent Trial and Appeal Board decision was affirmed by the Federal Circuit also. Uh, the same uh, set of patents then came up this, this January uh, at the EPO. Um, you probably recall that there were oral proceedings in January. Um, this was a slightly different case. This was about a priority. So it was an Article 85.1 EPC objection. Um, and as you, as you probably remember, what had happened was that um, it was claiming the priority on, on based, it was a, a P, um, PCT application based on the earlier um, uh, USPTO application. But um, what they had effectively done, what Broad had done, is that they had omitted one of the original applicants so that it became an issue of the priority of the application and the question before the, the, the Board of Appeal in oral proceedings in January is are A and B as applicants for the priority application um, wh when that's the case can person A alone then be the sole applicant in the subsequent application because applicant B had basically gone and worked for somebody else. Um, and you might remember that this was dealt with quite swiftly in, in the oral proceedings. They didn't even use the full four days allocated because they said, well, there's, there's an established um, case law at the EPO um, about um, what any person means under Article 87.1 EPC. So none of this so far is really about the kind of the morality issues of the patent. So it's kind of that that I want to now uh, turn my attention to. Okay, um, you probably know that a lot of my work is actually on, on TRIPS and international patent law. So I, I take as my starting point, of course, Article 27.2 of TRIPS uh, about, um, you know, the permissive language that WTO members may exclude from patentability uh, inventions where it's necessary to protect order public and morality. Um, and uh, I won't even bother referring to the biotech directive, um, but uh, um, of course then this, this language is, is reflected in, in Article 6 of the biotech directive in particular, um, and as you know, subsequently in the implementing regulations to the EPC uh, in Rule 28, uh, which talks specifically about the fact that uh, EPC European patents shall not be granted in respect of biotech inventions, um, in particular concerning, and I've highlighted paragraph B, processes for modern, modifying the germline genetic identity of human beings. Um, <clears throat> the patent examiners in the examining division of the EPO that I've been talking to about the types of, of, of patent claims that they've been receive, receiving um, in uh, genome editing technologies. They've said, yeah, but it's not just about Rule 28 and, and morality issues. It's also about what's set out in the claims and that the examiners, of course, always look at Rule 29, um, that the claims shall define the matter for which protection is sought uh, in terms of the technical features of the invention. And the reason I'm explaining this is because in the cases that we've been looking at, Broad and UC Berkeley, when I actually looked at the European patent document and the claims and compared the European patent application filed with the patents granted, 
what I started to see was that the claim language had been amended during EPO pro patent prosecution. So having spoken to the examining division at the EPO, the examiner said, well, this is perfectly normal that the examining division would do that. Um, having regard, in, of course, to um, Article 28, but also thinking about how you can then apply the principles in Article 28 on the limitations of what constitutes patentable subject matter by using the claim construction, um, having regard to Rule 29, this, it's not surprising that you see what the examiners are doing, is that they're, the examiners are asking the applicant to explicitly state that, of course, what, what is being claimed is a, a system of delivering, so it's a vector. Um, so the claim language has been amended uh, to specifically provide that it says, uh, uh, provided that the said use of the vector, the delivery system, is not a process for modifying the germline genetic identity of human beings. So for the examining division, this is just perfectly normal that that's, that's what they would do. They would use Rule 29 as a mechanism to apply the principles of exclusion in Rule 28. Um, so I just want to move on and uh, finish in time for us to have a, a, a nice discussion about all this. Um, I'm going to sh show you in a minute that there's actually an SSRN paper where I've talked about all this, and I'll show you a slide uh, with the title of that paper in a minute. Um, but in the paper, I also explore how all this, the issues of patenting are actually related to human rights, because that's something I'm interested in as well. Um, and the international law on um, uh, germline genetic identity is really underpinned by the Universal Direct Declaration on Human Rights of 1948, which of course you're familiar with, and then is expressed explicitly in the Oviedo Convention of 1997, which in, in Article 13 is the only piece of international law that talks specifically about modifying the human genome. And it talks about the fact that this should only be done in order to undertake uh, preventive diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. Um, and only if the aim is not to introduce modification into the genome of subsequent generations. Um, so some of the discussions that I've been engaged in, um, I'll explain to you about the National Institutes of um, of sciences, uh, National Academies of Sciences in the US and the Royal Society have been holding a series of public consultations about the global governance of, of um, uh, heritable human germ line identity work uh, in general. Um, and they've been talking a lot about this provision, about how this relates to sort of human rights principles. So the, really just to finish, this and then I'll, I'll conclude with uh, just a few extra slides. In my paper, what I'm really concerned with is how this relates to the public interest. Um, if these patents have been granted, I believe that they're part of the governance system and need to be taken into account uh, by the expert group of, of the World Health Organization, uh, for example, which is currently consulting on this. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the welfare of the future person. You know, who has, who, to whom are the human rights accorded? Is it to the parents to decide this? Or is it to the future person who's not yet burn, born, who's likely to have implications if their genome is edited? Um, and the disability groups, for example, have had a, you know, made a lot of interventions about the fact that people living with particular disabilities might be edited out of, of future society. And what does that say about people living today with these types of uh, disabilities? Um, secondly, do we want to practice uh, and, and do we want to grant patents on this type of bioengineering techniques, technique and, and um, should it be released into society? Uh, and finally, um, who should have access to gene editing technologies? Um, and and uh, our colleague uh, Aisling McMahon, of course, has been doing some excellent work on the Broad Institute licensing uh, options 
um, for allowing access to the, the patents that I've, I've been describing earlier. So it's an issue of uh, pre-grant uh, about how we uh, put limitations on the, on, on the claims uh, and it's issue, issue of licensing post-grant issues as well. So this is the paper where I really talk about all these things. Um, it's on SSRN uh, at the moment and I'm, um, I'm, I'll be submitting it to a journal quite soon. Um, just to explain how this fits into my bigger project, you know, my kind of book project is really thinking about how to, we can break all these down into different components. So I think there's in it, there are issues of risk. There are issues of how risk is regulated. Um, for example, through the Human Fertilization and Embryo Authority in the, in the UK or equivalent um, uh, bioethical regulators uh, elsewhere. Um, there are issues of ethics, so um, medical ethics specialists are, are involved with this, and um, Richard Ashcroft, my, my former colleague at Queen Mary now at City University, and I talk a lot about this. I would argue that there are issues of rights um, and about who those rights are accorded to. Of course, I think there are issues of, of patents and how patents plays a role in the governance system. And as I've just explained, there are issues of, of access as well. Um, and this is just a slide, just to give you an example of, of what a complex picture uh, we're, we're dealing with here, because um, this is just to show you some of the different models for different types of pre-implantation or in vitro um, uh, human germline genetic modification, how these are regulated in different countries. I think what's most interesting is in grey, you can see that a lot of countries don't have any regulation at all uh, on these matters. Um, however, these systems may well have recourse under um, you know, national patent laws where they've used uh, order public and morality provisions to take these into account. Um, so, so that you know, th I think there are issues about how patents can play a role in systems which don't have other gov governance mechanisms that are pre present. So I mentioned that there, there are a number of international initiatives that have been um, looking at this. And I talked about Dr. He and the CCR5 uh, genome editing on Lulu and Nana. He gave that announcement um, in November 2018 at the second meeting of the US National Academies of, of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, which in collaboration with the Royal Society has been undertaking a number of public hearings um, to uh, prepare a report on this. So on the 3rd of September, just a few days ago, the report of the um, National Academies of Sciences and the Royal Society was, was published and there was a launch event online. Uh, it's, uh, the report's, I think, 225 pages long. So um, straight after the launch event, I had a look to see whether there's anything about patents in there, and there's nothing about the patent system at all, which seems a bit strange uh, in many ways. However, at the launch event and in the report, it says specifically that the, um, the International Commission um, uh, have left matters of governance to the World Health Organization expert group, which was set up initially in August 2019. So that's why earlier this morning, I was talking to the secretariat at the World Health Organization about how I think my expert group can inform the World Health Organization's um, deliberations on the governance of genome editing. Um, so this is my last slide, and it's just to show you the amazing people who um, are on my working group at Queen Mary Intellectual Property Research Institute. Um, so uh, Richard Ashcroft, I mentioned, who's a um, professor of uh, medical ethics. Uh, Nick Bassel is the patent attorney who drafted the patent uh, on Dolly the Sheep um, and leads the, um, the team, um, the biology team at Kilburn and Strode. Uh, Peter Browder um, at King's College um, is, um, uh, did, did much of the, you know, the groundbreaking work on uh, uh, pre-implantation 
um, uh, analysis of, of human embryos. So it's great to have scientists who, who began by, I mean, Peter began by saying, this has got nothing to do with the work that we do. These patents have got nothing to do with what we do. And slowly, slowly, we've kind of encouraged the, the scientists in the committee to think about actually probably patents do have something to say for you. Ruth Fletcher, my colleague at Queen Mary, um, comes from a, a feminist law background. So it's really useful to, to hear you know, her, about her work on you know, the, the rights of, of pregnant women and the rights of the unborn child. Frances Flinter, again, is a, um, a geneticist working um, at Guy's and St. Thomas's. Emanuela Gambini, I have to give a shout out to Manny Mella, she's my postdoc, and she came up with a title addressing the patent gap, because we think there's a gap. Um, Andy Greenfield um, at Harwell Institute in Oxford, um, he's doing groundbreaking work on um, animal husbandry and, and uh, genome editing in, in animals. So again, it's a science pers perspective. Aisling, of course, you know, and I mentioned how she's done great work on the Broad Institute patent and, and, and more broadly on, on the governance of um, in, this, in this area and the role that patents play. Peter Mills, Nuffield Council on Bioethics. If you haven't read their two reports in this area, I recommend them. And there's a Nuffield, a Nuffield report coming out um, early next year on genome editing in animals. So that would be a series of three. Timo Minson, my good friend, you no doubt know as well. Um, Nora Schultz is from the German Ethics Council, and you, it's amazing to hear the different perspectives given the fairly recent history of, of uh, eugenics in Germany, what a different approach a German Ethics Council takes to this. Peter Thompson is the chief executive of the um, uh, HFEA, um, and it's, so it's really Good to hear regulators' uh, view. And uh, Jakob Vested and Esther van Zimmerman, you'll probably know already, they were uh, part of um, Timo Minson's research team in Copenhagen, and they're both doing great work on the governance of patents as well. Um, so that's kind of what I've done and what we're planning to do um, in the future. So I will start. Stop...